And I have used Wikipedia a little bit uh, as a, a starting point. And I think it is actually good. There, there are some uh, uh, good um, uh, things in terms of the Wikipedia uh, anti-nuclear movement and anti-nuclear movement in the US. It's a starting point to, uh, to reading about some of these issues. And then, of course, I uh, used a lot of personal experience and connections to, to add to that. So this is a very familiar picture for, for many of you. And we know August 6th, uh, 1945, little boy causing big damage. You see, seeing this picture too. And three days later, August 9th, fat man in Nagasaki, victims again. And people left. I won't comment on this. This you can get from uh, uh, the Hiroshima Museum, too, and their websites. But after this launch, uh, uh, many people who were scientists, including the people who worked on the Manhattan Project, uh, were concerned themselves about what they had done. Robert Oppenheimer, who was the leader of the Manhattan Project, actually said to uh, Harry Truman, uh, Mr. President, I believe that we've got blood on our hands. And Harry Truman's response was, it all come out in the wash. Uh, but Oppenheimer and many of the other scientists had, had great regrets and, and worked then against nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons spread. Uh, so uh, among the people who uh, were uh, most concerned about this uh, was uh, at Albert Einstein. And uh, Einstein got together with Bertrand Russell, and uh, in uh, the mid 1950s uh, launched what was called the Russell Einstein Manifesto. They had a letter, uh, but then the manifesto actually was released after Einstein's death uh, by Russell, and it was signed by many other prominent scientists. And uh, and in this letter, uh, of course, uh, Albert Einstein is known for talking about uh, we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking uh, if mankind is to survive. But uh, one thing that uh, Einstein said, which I think is important for anybody here, is that uh, remember your humanity and forget the rest. And out of this, many scientists were motivated to, uh, to form uh, the, the Pugwash uh, movement and the Pugwash conferences on science and world affairs. Uh, so the first of the Pugwash conferences uh, took place in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. You had uh, the Canadian uh, industrialist, I believe, uh, Mr. Eaton, who uh, agreed to sponsor that, and that's why it ended up uh, occurring in Canada. And Joseph Roblat, um who was uh, the one scientist, apparently, who had resigned from the Manhattan Project before they developed the bomb. Uh, I think that there were others, but he's reputed as being the one scientist who led this uh, movement, uh, ended up uh, winning the Nobel Peace Prize along with Pugwash uh, in 1995 uh, for, for uh, such efforts. So scientists uh, certainly can be activists. Uh, the Federation of Atomic Scientists also worked uh, to educate the public about uh, uh, the policy debate uh, uh, for, um, and advocated for international control of nuclear weapons. Uh, so with the Pugwash conferences, uh, they also developed the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, uh, and again related to, to the scientific experts. That, that, that uh, this uh, magazine has uh, been published since 1945. It's now available online. Uh, but it was former Manhattan Project physicists uh, who uh, led to, uh, to the journal. Uh, this is really famous because of that thing in the upper right, the doomsday clock. And many of you may not have heard of the bulletin, but have heard of the doomsday clock. And, uh, we're now supposed to be three minutes away from midnight from doomsday. And they've moved the clock probably, usually not more than every four or five years in terms of looking at the danger 
of nuclear annihilation. But scientists, and, and they base things on uh, not just technological things, but mainly world affairs in terms of how close we are. So scientists certainly advocated against nuclear weapons and the nuclear weapons spread. And in the 19, uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, you had above ground nuclear tests in uh, the, the US. And then some people started to question what was happening with the fallout. And they started to, some scientists were actually studied um, the effects of, uh, of these things and felt, well, maybe we shouldn't do this in the US. And they moved that to the South Pacific. Uh, and uh, and uh, so what happened was uh, scientists such as uh, um, Barry Commoner, uh, an ecologist, uh, uh, studied uh, deciduous teeth, the, the teeth that fall out of children, and found high levels of strontium. Now, strontium displaces calcium that's in, in the teeth. And the significance of this is that uh, the above ground tests actually um, uh, caused, uh, it, they ended up uh, contaminating grass, grass eaten by cows, and cow's milk that the children drank uh, apparently led to this. So there was a direct danger from these above ground tests. Uh, Linus Pauling, who had won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry related to uh, chemical bonds, also won the Nobel Prize for Peace uh, in advocating against uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the above ground nuclear test. Barry Commoner became uh, also quite well known with the founding of the uh, EPA and, uh, and really is considered one of the founders of the ecology in general. So a non-scientist, a physician, Albert uh, Schweitzer, had won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for his uh, uh, work in uh, Lambrene Gabon. And, uh, and, and he saw this as not uh, uh, the culmination of his life, but the start of uh, really trying to make a difference in the world. So um, a few years later, Schweitzer addressed the Nobel Peace Prize Committee in, in 1957. And uh, basically, uh, called for an end to above ground nuclear testing because of the dangers of fallout and uh, talked about future generations being vulnerable. This address was broadcast around the world but not in the US for, for some reason and was published uh, in the New York Times. So when Schweitzer got attention, even though his address wasn't uh, broadcast live in the US, the Atomic Energy uh, Commission or Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, responded. So this uh, one person, uh, the scientist William Libby, basically said, uh, Schweitzer, stick to medicine. Don't bother talking about uh, uh, th these tests or radiation. You don't know anything about that. Uh, we're much safer now in the 1950s than we were in the 1930s. But concentrations are less than 1% of what's permissible. And uh, the fallout's really quite small in comparison to other risks. Strontium-90, yeah, that's not really a problem. It's like moving a few uh, hundred feet up a hill or having a wooden house rather than a concrete or brick house. And turns out Libby wasn't right. So sometimes we have to take our science with a grain of salt, uh, too. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't use the scientific method. So moving on, 1950s and 60s, the Cold War. This is actually the father of a friend of mine uh, back in the uh, 1990s. But the Swiss, this is in Switzerland, in Fribourg in Switzerland, he was the head of civil defense in Switzerland. And Switzerland had built these whole underground cities basically meant to survive a nuclear attack. And uh, so, uh, and other natural disasters too. So you go there and then come out when the danger is there. And people were talking about that having their shelter in their own backyard. Uh, and so some things that might seem a bit ludicrous today, but people have their cans of soup in their shelter, and they, they uh, have air raid uh, sirens, and uh, they would uh, uh, go down there just as a test in preparation for a nuclear attack. 
And I think uh, one of your lectures, Meta, was on uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, again, we came quite close, we believe, to nuclear annihilation with threats and counter threats and some accidents, which, uh, which I'll talk about later. Uh, some people, uh, oh. Thanks, sir. Okay. <laughs> so, so some people uh, then um, actually uh, had uh, um, written about the end of the world. Something people aren't really talking about now. On the Beach is one book about the last surviving people in uh, uh, New Zealand and Australia. So artists also uh, contributed. So Stanley Kubrick developed this particular uh, uh, movie, which some of you might be interested in. Uh, Kubrick really showed some of the uh, um, the strangeness of, of thinking of leadership artistically in, in this movie. Yeah, so another major event uh, in most Canadians' lives uh, was this event. Uh, how, how many people who are under 40 have heard of this event? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, one person, okay. How many people over 40 do not know what this event is? <laughs> Oh, we've got a couple of people. So this was the hockey series between Canada and the Soviet Union. This was us fighting the Cold War in other ways, supposedly. We had the big bad Soviets that uh, didn't care about uh, human life, and they were using dirty tricks, and our boys ended up beating them. Uh, although the Soviets actually differ from who won the series because they scored more goals than we did. But uh, Evelyn Henderson, the mother of Paul Henderson, who scored the winning goal in the last three games. Uh, and he was really not a well-known hockey player before that. He was enough to be uh, on our elite team, but he would have been like uh, maybe the 15th best player, they would say. So she said that when Paul scored the goal, uh, it was like an atom bomb going off. And so that was the thinking even at that time, like an atom bomb could be a good thing. Most of us would not actually use that. I'm sure she would regret that analogy, but, uh, but, but uh, at that time, we were looking at destroying the world 80 times, 100 times over. So looking at uh, the bomb of uh, Hiroshima, and it was 15 kilotons, and the total explosive power of uh, World War II being uh, 11 megatons, we, we had 70,000 nuclear weapons and could destroy the world uh, many times over. This is from a few years ago. Uh, the number of nuclear weapons have come down, uh, so below 15,000 now. Um, uh, but uh, we have more nuclear power, so we've got more horizontal spread, as, as all of you know. So another scenario that people were talking about was with all of those nuclear weapons, how many would be required to actually uh, harm the world? Again, the scientists uh, spoke out and said you'd have all this fallout and you'd have a, a more of a dark cloud. Not necessarily really dark like an eclipse, but you'd have enough that you wouldn't get enough sunlight going to, uh, to, to have uh, plants growing. Or you'd lower the temperature slightly of the earth. And so Carl Sagan, another famous scientist, uh, along with uh, some climatologists, and there were the, the Turco, the, the TAPS uh, group, who, uh, who actually uh, did some studies. Other uh, scientists of the government, tried, military scientists, tried to discredit what they had to say. But again, this pointed to another uh, danger of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons use. I'm going to play a little bit here. So the scientists, once again, had something to say about uh, uh, the build-up. Uh, and uh, then so did the artists. So Sting was talking about that mindset of that we could uh, destroy the other side and lose a, a few million or tens of millions of our own side and win. And we assumed the other side didn't care about their children. So this is one artistic way of, uh, of uh, uh, looking at uh, the nuclear weapons issue.
Anybody heard of this person, Nina? No. Okay. Oh, even the younger ones have heard. How, how have you heard of them? I learned it from him. You learned it from him? How did you <laughs> learn about uh, Nina? Radio. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, um, yeah, I, I think you can't really read this mm -hmm. slide, but uh, this is uh, her song about launching some balloons and then that being mistaken for a military exercise and basically destroying the world so you see the world destroyed uh, behind her so it's a very catchy tune but with a very serious message and uh, and, and so um, I, I actually uh, find the song really beautiful in German she, she did an English version uh, after no, this is, but uh, yeah, so uh, artists, uh, though, were able to represent some of the insanity of this. Now, what happened right after this, in the 1990s, we actually had something like this, a balloon almost causing uh, uh, a nuclear war. And uh, the next slide, when I get to it. Yeah, this is right? Yeah. And that's what you want? That's fine, yeah. So. The, so in 1995, I don't know if you've talked about this, Meta, about a launch of a we weather balloon. Have you talked about uh, this in class? Uh, yeah, twice when I referred to it. But okay, well, again, you go probably ahead. know more details than I do. No, go ahead. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, there was a Norwegian weather balloon launched uh, off of its coast uh, by uh, uh, um, uh, just to look at the northern lights, aurora borealis, and uh, just studying this. And they informed the Soviets that they were going to do this, but somehow that wasn't communicated. And to, uh, to, to a lot of people in the uh, Soviet military, this looked like a missile being launched from a, a US submarine. And they ended up uh, contacting uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin, and, uh, and basically I think they couldn't get in touch with him. That they were supposed to, the Soviets were supposed to launch an attack in response to this when they see that, because you don't have time to react if the U.S. missiles have already destroyed your, your cap capability of of responding. Now, luckily, that was not at a time of uh, of war; it was uh, at a time of relative peace, uh, and. Uh, uh, and the other people who had the black suitcases with the nuclear footballs uh, did not uh, react and say, we, we better launch uh, something. And if this had been a, at a time of tension, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, or we might could say even today, uh, that, that if we're concerned about Ukraine, if things got hotter there, then you could actually have an accident triggering a nuclear war, much as Dr. Strangelove uh, uh, talked about. So artists are able to, uh, to sometimes foretell the future. As you said, that Dr. Strangelove uh, rec um, really relating to history. So other activists. So you have the campaign for nuclear uh, uh, disarmament in Britain, established in 1957. They had various marches uh, in, at the time of the Iraq War that they developed into an anti uh, war, uh, Iraq war group. Uh, they advocated for the cancellation of the Trident uh, uh, nuclear submarines uh, being uh, uh, stationed uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, and advocated uh, also unilateral uh, nuclear disarmament uh, by the UK. Um, uh, they, they were uh, uh, basically they ended up have, having rallies that started off with a few people in large rallies in the 1980s. Uh, they also were against depleted uranium, which was used in Iraq, and uh, military action that uh, results in weapons of mass destruction. So they're probably not as active now as they were uh, 20, 25 years ago, but still probably more active than our Canadian peace movement, I would say. Uh, you had women involved at Greenham Commons uh, to, uh, again, starting off with protesters numbering in the 20s and eventually ending up with 70,000 people demonstrating at Greenham Commons and, and having marches from, from London to Greenham Commons. 
So, uh, so really strong movement in Britain and many Western European countries. And I'm afraid, to, uh, unfortunately I can't really read my slides as well with my, my contacts in, so, so that's why I'm, I'm not going through them uh, uh, point by point, but probably wouldn't matter uh, whether I did. Basically, when you had these activists, you ended up having a counter movement of governments then saying that these people are dangerous. And, and some of the people who were involved in the peace camp were, uh, were communists or uh, had uh, some relations with the Soviet Union, but most probably did not. But they were considered like our foreign-funded environmental terrorists. And you know that you're becoming uh, effective when you actually trigger opposition sometimes. Uh, and, uh, and you had uh, churches who were involved, many mainstream organizations, but they were painted uh, all with the same brush. In New York, in the early 1980s, again, you, you had a movement. You wouldn't believe that in the US, although when uh, we look at 2003 in the US, you did have uh, a movement against the Iraq war, but you had a million people demonstrating in Central Park against nuclear weapons. That's me weapons. right over in the corner. You're in, you were there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, how many people were there? Yeah. And how old were you? I was 12 or something. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I wasn't there, but uh, many members of our organization of Physicians of Global Survival, Michael Dworkin was there. Uh, so this was really empowering for people. And the movement really did have uh, have something to say. So we had a mass movement. I mentioned Green and Common, but I mentioned the uh, the power of women. And I know that Voice of Women is uh, that that Janice Alton's having a dinner tonight too to, to raise funds and having an event tomorrow. But in Canada, uh, women have also been uh, working uh, tirelessly for for peace, and they use gender as a way of speaking, speaking as a mother. Uh, and, uh, and actually there's a film that uh, Terry Nash did with many activists in Canada and around the world, again from the 1980s, Speaking Our Peace, which you might want to, to look at. Um, and they had demonstrations where Canada was involved in terms of uh, the weapons industry. Uh, and uh, now when we think of, uh, of women, uh, we also uh, think of Mother's, and Mother's Day. And I, I just asked uh, Janice, whom uh, many of you know, who, uh, a, a bit more about the story of uh, a woman who's considered uh, a founder of Mother's Day, uh, Julia Ward Howe. And um, so around 1870, Julia Ward Howe, who, who also worked for uh, for things like uh, the vote for women, universal suffrage, and all those uh, nasty things like that. Uh, she, uh, she, she was really horrified by the Franco-Prussian War in, uh, in 1870 and said that Mother's Day was a time to think about uh, what weapons do. And she said, arise then women of this day, arise all women who have hearts, whether your baptism be that of water or of tears. Say firmly, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands shall not come to us reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we've been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We women of one country will be too tender uh, of those uh, of another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure uh, theirs. So women have often taken a leadership role in terms of this. Anybody know what this picture is about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Barbara, tell, tell us. <clears throat> that's uh, Peter Mackay, our defense minister, and that's his mother, who is a uh, very prominent uh, peace activist, actually. Yeah, so, so Peter's now justice minister, but was defense minister, very proud of flying in planes, sometimes going to 
fishing trips on planes too. I'll we can talk about that. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, his mother is a really prominent peace activist in Nova Scotia, and he actually had a tweet for his mother and uh, and included this picture. So I decided I'd have that. Mothers can sometimes influence their their sons, and sometimes not. He's the guy. He's the guy that signed an agreement not to amalgamate the Conservatives and the Tories, and then went back against his signed agreement, yeah. right? Yeah. Are you related to David Orchard? By any? No, I'm just. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's another. I'm related to David Orchard. Okay, that's another uh, another story entirely, which we we won't get through if I uh, continue on. So. Um, so other things that people were concerned about were the cost in this whole industry, the military-industrial complex. And Dwight Eisenhower, who was president of the US, who had been a military general, a war hero, he was the one who spoke as in his uh, last address as president of the dangers about guarding against the military-industrial complex. He said, every gun that is made, every warship uh, that uh, is uh, launched. launched. Every rocket that is fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending uh, money alone. It's spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, and the hopes of its children. This is a really powerful speech for you to look at. And, and this is another reason why many people oppose the nuclear weapons industry, the, the, the cost of that. And the U.S. being by far the biggest spender in, um, in real dollars, uh, about as much as the next 10 countries combined. And the cost of war on the U.S. taxpayer, of course, is, uh, is uh, horrific. So a lot of people have opposed the cost of war from that point of view. This slide here is from about 25 years ago, talking about specific military purchases and how you might manage human needs. This was another way of advocacy, again, involving uh, economists and uh, physicians. We, we, we had uh, this from the uh, British Medical Journal about 20 years ago by Vic Seidel and Barry Levy, talking about the human development costs of arms imports. And again, many countries continue to invest in that. I, I was born in India. India at that time ordered 20 MiG-29 fighters from Russia at a cost that could have provided basic education to all 15 million girls out of school. So these things cost us uh, a fair bit. Anybody know what this slide is on the, the left? What's that scene? That's from the Orange is New Black. Yes, that's, that's right. The nuns activist based on yes. Oh, I don't remember. Our death. Yeah, I, I, actually, I'm going to look uh, this uh, this story up uh, too. So, so what happened is uh, so this uh, for those of you who don't know this story, uh, Orange is the New Black. It's a women's prison story. It's gone through three seasons, and season four is coming out in June. Uh, but one of the minor characters is this nun there. And th this nun is on this hunger strike. But the nun was an anti-nuclear activist, and based on somebody that Piper Kerman actually met in real life in prison, who, who inspired her. And uh, ba basically, churches have been uh, against nuclear weapons, as I, I mentioned, a lot of churches, the, the uh, Catholic bishops in the US, Southern Baptists, uh, Episcopalians, many rabbis, all, all uh, had uh, spoken against that and they had demonstrations. But some people went even further. Uh, there were a couple of priests who were brothers, uh, Daniel Berrigan and Philip Berrigan, who uh, got involved in more direct action. They were people who uh, started off, uh, they were motivated by a woman named Dorothy Day of the Catholic Workers' Movement. And Dorothy Day felt that you couldn't just give charity to other people, but you had to go work with the poor. And beyond that, uh, so, so these people actually engaged directly with people. They went into ghetto neighborhoods that most whites wouldn't. 
uh, and they were largely whites in terms of these uh, activists, so Catholic lay people and priests uh, launching the Catholic Workers' Movement. So Philip and uh, Daniel Berrigan also were against the Vietnam War. They ended up uh, burning, uh, going into some institutions and burning other people's draft cards and doing mock things with napalm. Uh, but they also engaged uh, with the uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, industry. And uh, they went to King of Prussia in Pennsylvania, where GE had a, a plant. And they decided they would do what, uh, what the Bible uh, says in terms of beating, uh, 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 beating uh, um, swords into plowshares. So I'll just read uh, from Isaiah too, if I, if I can uh, again actually read my writing uh, here. So, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the Lord of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war no more. So from the Bible, these people took that very personally and, uh, and went down and used their own blood. They poured their own blood. They hammered the, the missiles uh, there in places. And then they served prison sentences, of course, because these were uh, terrorists. They, they, they considered themselves not to be the real terrorists, uh, but uh, they, they had uh, felony counts and misdemeanor counts. Uh, for, for an action in 1980, they actually finally were sentenced uh, in 1990. Uh, there's a movie called King of Prussia with Martin Sheen, which uh, relates to this. Uh, they also uh, considered uh, Martin Luther King to be um, a great inspiration. And Martin Luther King uh, actually said, when scientific power outruns spiritual power, we end up with guided missiles and misguided men. And, uh, and uh, so, this uh, Ardeth Platt, the sister who uh, Piper Kerman used, and Jackie Hudson uh, and Carol Gilbert, all nuns, uh, went uh, in the early 2000s to Colorado Springs Air Force Base, the NORAD headquarters, where Minutemen uh, uh, three missiles are, are launched. Um, and, uh, and they did the same sort of thing, hammering and pouring blood. And you sort of wonder, how did they, and they also held a worship service. How do you actually get into these places? These really secure places, all they have is little box cutters. And they somehow got in, in 2002. Then in 2009, you had uh, uh, more Jesuit priests uh, going to, uh, uh, to Bangor uh, Base in, uh, in Washington. Uh, and uh, so this naval base is the home port of the largest single stockpile with more than 2,000 nuclear warheads about 24% of the U.S. arsenal. So eight Trident sub submarines are there, carrying up to 24, uh, 24 Trident II missiles, each capable of having up to eight independently targetable nuclear warheads, between 100 and 475 kilotons. So once again, they went in and then uh, were uh, there for, for a fair length of time, and then finally, they were handcuffed, hooded, uh, face down, and they refused to give any information about themselves, and uh, got uh, got prison sentences. Even this past uh, earlier this year, you had another set of nuns. So Megan Rice, 83 years old, along with a couple of other Catholic lay people, uh, who uh, were also in their 60s, ended up going to the Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee nuclear weapons uh, uh, production facility where they enriched, uh, it's still a rich uh, uranium, uh, production of plutonium for nuclear bombs, but that was used for the Manhattan Project. Again, going in there and managing to be ours, and then they call people and say, come and get us, and nobody notices them. Uh, and, uh, but they end up, uh, she was sentenced to two years in prison again. So, so, so some people engage in more direct action, uh, and 
Yeah. Neil, are you aware, that, or can you announce that, I think it's the current, or maybe it's the March issue, maybe already superseded, of the New Yorker. Yeah, March 3rd that's issue of the New Yorker. Terrific that's, uh, article about all of these people, these nuns. Yeah. It's a wonderful article. Yeah, yeah, and, and so I actually looked at that uh, again earlier today. So religious organizations have had a lot to do in terms of opposing nuclear weapons. This is a Japanese organization, a Buddhist organization, uh, which uh, has uh, more than 12 million members, SGI. Uh, again, they, they called in 1957 for a complete ban on nuclear weapons. Uh, they uh, had a petition in 1975 that garnered uh, more than 10 million signatures against nuclear weapons. Uh, they're a bit of a controversial group, though, because they have some relationship with uh, one of the major uh, political uh, parties in, uh, in Japan. And so not everybody who is uh, interested in peace in Japan actually thinks highly of them, uh, because uh, there is uh, something in the Japanese constitution also demanding separation between politics and religion, but another organization to look at. We find that uh, the voice of victims is often a very powerful voice. And this is from 1989 from a conference I went to in Hiroshima with victims talking to us. I'm actually in the front row there with a bit more hair and a bit darker hair. Uh, but uh, um, the person in the top left corner, anybody know her? Yeah, so Setsuko Thurlow is in Toronto, a survivor of Hiroshima, 12 years old when, uh, when uh, uh, she lost many of her classmates and family. And she's spoken out, she's been an ardent peace activist, not just with Hiroshima Day, but with many other things. Uh, she's also been on the Peace Boat, again a Japanese-funded venture, bringing youth from around uh, the world uh, to, uh, to, to talk peace. And uh, some of you who are young enough might, uh, might be interested in joining the Peace Boat. So other types of actions. Anybody heard of this organization? Yeah, nobody's heard of this. Uh, yeah, so again, offices in more than 40 countries, uh, now headquarters in Amsterdam. Canada was involved with, uh, many Canadians were involved with uh, the founding of things. Concerned about many environmental issues. Uh, as well as peace issues, but engaging in direct action. Not quite like our, uh, uh, our nuns, but, uh, but at least uh, something uh, much more than, uh, than just lobbying and research. Doesn't accept funding from governments or corporations. Uh, many individual supporters. Um, I mean, Greenpeace was sort of the in thing for some people and they uh, from the 70s to, to, to 90s. Uh, I remember a Seinfeld episode uh, too uh, where Elaine's partner goes there to impress her uh, uh, on, on a ship. Um, but uh, basically, uh, uh, so they ended up uh, being founded more by people who were pacifists, who were uh, concerned that uh, uh, we had to do more than just uh, bear witness, and they ended up demonstrating uh, initially in BC uh, against uh, the nuclear industry. In 1979, or well, it's not 70, it's 78, so they, they, they launched uh, the Rainbow Warrior, a uh, famous uh, uh, ship, and they were wanted to talk about uh, toxic uh, dumping. Uh, in uh, the South Pacific, and then also in terms of above-ground nuclear tests and its effects on uh, Pacific Islanders. And the French were the one country which didn't move their nuclear tests below ground uh, because of uh, uh, various political reasons, and they felt quite threatened. And so you had some French agents who decided to go while the uh, uh, the ship was in New Zealand waters, I think in the harbor in Auckland, uh, that the French president uh, gave orders that let's bomb the ship so it won't uh, make us look bad. Unfortunately, they, they launched two bombs, and the second bomb killed a Dutch photographer. 
Uh, and uh, so then this became more uh, widespread in terms of uh, uh, finding out who was responsible. And uh, you actually had people who were convicted of, uh, of this act of terrorism. Uh, and um, so Greenpeace was considered the terrorists by others, and yet they were the victims of this sort of action. Um, I'm, I'm getting beyond my time, haven't I, Meta? Uh, well, I don't know. Let's see. What do we have? 516? Yeah, you. Are you fine with me? Just keep on going. If you want. Okay. Well, why don't I, I keep on going uh, then? Because I got a few more stories to tell. Um, so, IPPW, uh, an organization that's the, uh, the parent organization of Physicians for Global Survival, the winner of the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize, an organization that I've been part of. Uh, an organization which is supposed to be in 58 countries dedicated to research, education, and advocacy relevant to the prevention of nuclear war. Uh, and it also works on other wars uh, uh, too and wants to minimize the effects of war and preparations for war on health development and the environment. So where did our IPPW come out of? came out of the 1960s again. Uh, with a study published in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine by um, Mick Seidel, Bernard Mellon, and Jack Geiger. Uh, and uh, so what they, they were looking at was uh, what would be the effects of a nuclear attack on Boston. And basically they found that uh, there would be no medical response to a nuclear attack. And um, I'll explain that a little bit more. So they looked at all of the things that would happen. The people would be blinded by the flash, the burns, the pressure wounds, the shards that would go into people's lungs and bones, the people dying of radiation sickness, the infections, the pain, the stories you've seen from Hiroshima. They also looked at infrastructure, the shortage of water and electricity, uh, the inability to transport in. And they said, basically, in Boston, 70% of doctors would be dead. And you'd have one doctor uh, there to treat 1,500 uh, seriously injured patients. And they've done studies, again, on New York, New York City. And if we look at the inner part of this, uh, uh, so if you had an attack on New York, you'd end up getting a lot of the, the hospitals in New York. And in that uh, central area, 98% of people dying and so on and so forth, that the, the facts you've already heard. And they said basically you wouldn't have enough burn beds in all of the U.S. to deal with the victims of one uh, nuclear attack on Boston. So if there's no medical response, a nuclear war shouldn't be fought, we shouldn't have nuclear weapons. One of the major spokespeople uh, for uh, the movement uh, uh, was uh, Helen Caldicott. Uh, she was the author, uh, or not the author, well, she became the author of If You Love This Planet. But first there was a film by Terry Nash, and I mentioned, talking about the women's peace movement, uh, which, uh, which I'll try to, again, show a really brief clip, uh, because we don't have so much time. Let's see if I can get there. Up into Jason to the first. And a little boy was reaching up to catch a red dragonfly on his hand against the blue sky. And there was a blinding flash, and he disappeared. And so did tens of thousands of other human beings. Tons of TNT. In one bomb, that's four times the size of all bombs dropped during the Second World War. One bomb. Now, they, they once made a 50 megaton bomb, which America blew up in the Pacific, in the South Pacific, and they got such a terrible shock, they never did that again. They could easily make a 100 megaton bomb, they're awfully easy to make. If you exploded that in space, Increasing the diameter of destruction the higher up you go, you can wipe out six western states of the United States of America with one bomb. You are all children of the atomic age. You have grown up with this. 
You probably have nightmares sometimes about nuclear war. Some of you, uh, when you were young, practiced drill in your schools, hiding under your desks in case a bomb dropped, putting bits of paper on your head to hide from the nuclear explosions, right? You remember those days? So today, America has 30 to 35,000 nuclear weapons. That's enough, they say, the Pentagon says, to overkill, which is a Pentagon word and not a medical term, overkill every Russian human being 40 times. Uh, Russia has 20,000 bombs. That's enough to overkill every American human being 20 times. So who's ahead or who's behind? If you think about this in medical terminology, how many times can you kill a human being? And they say, oh, Russia's ahead. You see, the mentality is about at a level of a nine-year-old boy. So, uh, so, so Helen Caldicott, really powerful uh, speaker, pediatrician, still around speaking about uh, nuclear power and many other issues. Uh, and many of us uh, know her. Um, so again, bringing this medical message that, uh, that nuclear weapons were, uh, were, were ludicrous. Again, so in the event of a nuclear attack, don't bother to call your doctor. So if you're in that center of the city where you're targeted, you, unless you're amongst the 2% of people who, uh, who survive uh, there, uh, you're not going to be there to treat. So that's doctors, nurses, and other uh, healthcare personnel. So there could be no medical response. The nuclear war was unwinnable. So, um, so what was important about this? So nuclear weapons, of course, were, uh, were not uh, uh, good for your health. The World Health Organization said, uh, too, that the only approach uh, is primary prevention. So the prevention of nuclear war, not treatment of nuclear war. So the importance of this is those co-founders uh, of this organization, IPPNW, Bernard Lown in the center. Bernard Lown, who had authored that paper about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the attack on Boston. Uh, he was the inventor of the defibrillator, which we see all, all around, an expert in sudden cardiac death. He had a friend, Evgeny Chazov, in the Soviet Union, also an expert in sudden cardiac death. And they would meet at conferences, and they'd, they'd be entertaining each other's uh, families. And they'd say, here we are trying to save individuals. Meanwhile, our countries are trying to destroy each other. That's ludicrous. Chazov was, uh, as a cardiologist in Moscow, was uh, uh, renowned. And who were the leaders in Moscow at the time? Old Russian men. What happens to old Russian men? <laughs> so he was the cardiologist to much of the Soviet leadership. And um, so he had the ear of the Soviet leadership. Gorbachev, when he came to power, found this message really persuasive. And he credits IPPNW with think changing his thinking in Perestroika. And he says that uh, what the doctors say made sense. And he agreed to disarming more than what his generals told him was safe. Because he said, we can't use these weapons anyway. So we can't fight with them. This is from 2004, but I won't talk about that. Um, so IPPNW engaged in more research and education and um, around nuclear weapons. Our group, uh, I should say our group, uh, I'm a member, but not uh, in the leadership, Physicians for Global Survival, uh, is concerned about the, uh, the abolition of nuclear weapons, prevention of war, the promotion of Nonviolent means of conflict resolution and social justice in a sustainable world. We've also done presentations. I've did, done this uh, in terms of in Kitchener. What would happen with a 20 megaton air blast? And what would happen with a one uh, megaton surface blast? And there are things available on the web for you to simulate what would happen in your, your city. What would happen with fallout with prevailing winds? And how many people would be dying of that? Our medical students in IPPNW also use that as a tactic. They put this red target in the center of cities, and then they start to talk to any passers-by about the effects of nuclear weapons. If this was where a bomb land landed, 
who would be dying around here. I've also uh, written in, in Time Magazine in response to something about deterrence uh, that Charles Krauthammer, one of these political analysts had in terms of basically saying everybody's trying to develop everybody else and meanwhile we're developing weapons uh, to, uh, to destroy the world. A lot of other people have written op-eds and papers. We had one of our members who's passed away, Alan Phillips, who talked about uh, the effects of uh, a nuclear bomb explosion on the habitants of a city, but also talked about accidents that got us close to nuclear war. We had uh, articles about uh, many of us in, in papers. We had a petition 10 years ago getting a lot of prominent uh, Canadians uh, asking for a world free of nuclear weapons in Canada to take a, uh, a leadership role in that. A uh, pediatrician, again, who's passed away, one of my mentors, Alex Bryans, developed this thing, really what, what, we, uh, what nuclear weapons threaten. I also have, uh, because of being an Indian, of Indian origin, I've been back and forth uh, many times. And in India, people are very proud of their nuclear weapons. When India tested in 1998, there were celebrations throughout the, the city, uh, or throughout the land, I should say. Uh, Indians believe that they have different arguments for uh, nuclear weapons creating uh, more security. I think I'm going to skip through this section because I want more time for discussion. Anyway, they, they had various arguments which aren't entirely illogical, uh, and, but it's just that when I spoke, I said, would nuclear weapons make India more secure? I talked about the effects of uh, a bomb on Bombay, uh, and if you had bombs uh, landing on Bombay and Karachi, IPPNW has had a study of what would happen there. I talked about nuclear parity, that when Pakistan exploded its first nuclear weapon, uh, did, did its first test uh, three weeks after India did. Pakistan would have never launched uh, a test because it would be concerned about world condemnation if India hadn't, and that put them at parity and talked about the, not just uh, losing people, but the costs of weaponization, uh, which were substantial for a country that wasn't well. And I said that basically it was like an addiction, that uh, having nuclear weapons was like an addiction. David Krieger, writes about ending nuclear addiction, but I talked about these arguments, like the arguments of an alcoholic, but I won't go through that. Other people in India have also protested, artists like Arundhati Roy uh, and uh, Achim Vinayak. Uh, um, there, there are various uh, people who have been speaking within India about that. Also important in terms of nuclear weapons are is money, and again, in the uh, name of time, I won't go through this slide, but the Plowshares Fund in the U.S. funds a lot of uh, activities. We have the Simons Foundation in Canada, but you do need to have some funds to, to launch things uh, to, as an activist. We've engaged in legal challenges, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, what happened was uh, groups, IPPNW, uh, International Association Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Weapons, Iolana, uh, and uh, I think Royal Federalists, a few uh, international groups decided that they'd take the nuclear weapons states uh, to uh, the uh, World Court, to the International Court of Justice. And the International Court of Justice concluded in 1996 that the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons would be generally contrary to international law. Um, and this we considered a major victory. Uh, not that it's necessarily changed policies, but it gives us something to say that uh, countries should not be uh, should not be promoting this. It did say that if this, the existence of a state was threatened, that a state could conceivably use nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, but overall, we consider that to be uh, a major victory. So. Legal uh, lawyers are also important, at least in this, uh, in this domain. So are politicians. Global Zero is a, a group of politicians. You may have heard of other groups like Mayors for Peace and Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. We have uh, Doug Roach uh, in Canada who leads a lot of groups. 
Many of us have uh, gotten our cities, including Toronto, uh, to uh, become mayors for peace again, uh, against nuclear armaments. We have um, ex-generals around the world, or ex-military people also, who uh, people who have been in charge of the Tridents, or uh, in, in charge of uh, really the ones who would be launching uh, nuclear weapons. Once they retire, then they end up uh, saying that uh, this is all wrong. Uh, Rob Green in Britain is uh, as a commander in Britain. Uh, you had Lee Butler in uh, the U.S. General Lee Butler, uh, Admiral Ramdas, and uh, and uh, um, you know Seidel in India. Um, many people leave the military, and then they uh, they say that uh, nuclear weapons are, are wrong. But you also find even some of the uh, the hawks, the Cold War hawks. Uh, so in 2007, you had Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State, the one who launched many wars for the U.S. <coughs> uh, over in secret. Bill Perry, who was Secretary of Defense. George Shultz, who was Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan. Sam Nunn, a uh, 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 senator. Uh, they were considered Cold War warriors in favor of nuclear weapons for deterrence. And they ended up having an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal saying that uh, that, that nuclear weapons had to be uh, eliminated. They, they talked about it as something more phased and uh, a little bit, not, they, they weren't quite where we are. Even Obama uh, spoke about uh, being against that when he first uh, uh, took office. How much the, they've acted uh, is debatable. You have had countries which have renounced nuclear weapons from uh, Kazakhstan after the fall of the Soviet Union and uh, South Africa. So even in uh, 1990, you had uh, that. Canada also refused to pursue its nuclear program, but we still remain under the nuclear umbrella. So you do have some movement with states saying that they wouldn't do that. I think I'm going to, should, should I say anything about nuclear power, do you think? Um, yes. You want me to say something about nuclear power, okay. So again, the, the accidents uh, of Three Mile Island and Chernobyl in the 70s and 80s uh, led to uh, some movement against uh, nuclear power. And of course, those of us who are Simpsons fans, uh, we, we know Mr. Burns uh, there. Um, so this became more popular media where we saw dangers of nuclear power. And we have got various reasons for opposing nuclear power, as you've learned in the class. Uh, uh, to the, the meltdown issues, radioactive waste disposal, uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, the hidden costs uh, in, in terms of costs that are uh, externalized, and subsidies, and, uh, and then the uh, dangers of terrorism, attacks on nuclear plants by people other than nuns and priests. Um, and once again, artists played a role in highlighting some of the dangers. Uh, there was a story of Karen Silkwood, a film uh, that Meryl Streep uh, starred in, uh, with somebody who was uh, concerned about, uh, she, she was a worker in a plant, and she was concerned about the dangers of radioactivity and ended up dying under mysterious circumstances. There was this film called The China Syndrome with Jane Fonda uh, and Jack Lemmon, which was really quite, uh, quite well known. And this came just before Three Mile Island talking about the China syndrome of a nuclear weapon going through the, the earth, coming out the other side, supposedly. So after Fukushima, you had uh, many protests uh, in uh, countries like Germany against uh, nuclear power. And Germany uh, ended up renouncing nuclear power uh, after that. They, they had decided to move ahead with nuclear power, Angela Merkel's uh, um, and decided that uh, it would be good in September of 2000. Uh, and people started to protest. And after uh, Fukushima, uh, you had large demonstrations, and then they backed away from that. So citizen power actually changed what Germany did. For our uh, one person in your class who spoke out in favor of nuclear power, there are environmentalists who also speak out in favor of nuclear power. And Georges Monbiot, gave some of the same arguments as you did in terms of saying that 
these accidents actually show how safe nuclear power is. So uh, the, 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 the damage could be much worse. And, and George Monbiot was a convert, James Lovelock, who has the Gaia hypothesis. Many others actually have, have spoken uh, saying that nuclear power is still safe on balance worth the risk. There's a film called Pandora's Promise if you're interested in that argument. Uh, so finishing up, we have the present. What are we doing now? We've got conferences such as this Pegasus conference, which, uh, uh, which uh, CPREP is helping to lead and PGS is involved with, Peace, Global Health and Sustainability. We had Setsuko speak in our last conference, and if I had more time, I'd show you the video or some of the video of her talk, talking about her survival story. Uh, we're having a conference in a couple of weeks uh, that we not meaning CPREP, but Physicians for Global Survival, a nuclear uh, uh, symposium in Quebec City. Uh, and you could probably ask Barbara who's going if, if you're interested in, in going there. So that's talking about the whole nuclear uh, fuel cycle, right from mining uh, to uh, nuclear power to nuclear weapons. So in closing, remember that various uh, segments of society actually can, uh, can work uh, as activists, uh, there are organizations. Uh, Meta may be familiar with uh, some of these organizations, like Science for Peace, as many of you are members here. Uh, Plowshares, uh, Plowshares uh, have done studies on nuclear weapons. We've had people writing books. We have Peace Magazine, which I guess I'll advertise to say, got a free copy today, say five dollars and fifty cents. Um, so. Um, and we also see in terms of uh, uh, the confluence of activists, we find indigenous people who are concerned about mining and contamination, along with environmentalists and peace activists. So this is uh, our present. We see court challenges. The, the ones who had the above ground testing in the South Pacific decided to sue the nuclear powers because under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, under Article 5, they're supposed to be disarming. And so they signed this treaty almost 50 years ago. They aren't moving to disarm it. So they, they said uh, that they lost their first challenge for the International Court of Justice. But they also are challenging in terms of the damage to, to the islands. We have uh, ICANN, another organization led by IPPNW, International Campaign, Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, uh, which has had different uh, conferences. CPREP, we're just there to educate, not to advocate. Be careful about taking that picture. We'll have to, somebody's <laughs> going to get back to me saying I'm an advocate, but I'm not an advocate, I'm an educator. So Why what's, are you not an advocate? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's the future then? So uh, we, we have various movements trying to look at nuclear-free zones. We have the Red Cross now has, has even uh, said that um, and the International Committee is, is actually working against nuclear weapons. That's something that we considered a major, uh, a major victory. Uh, we've had different conferences in, uh, uh, in Nayarit and uh, Vienna most recently. And the Austrian government and part of that Mexican government have said they would take uh, a leadership role in the abolition of nuclear weapons. So people see some momentum. But on the other hand, in uh, the 1990s, we were looking at abolition in 2000. Now we're looking at abolition in 2030. So we don't know what the future is going to be. We're hoping that, uh, that we can find a way of generating some of the, uh, the energy that we had earlier on to oppose this, because we're becoming complacent. So will our way of getting rid of nuclear weapons, will it be legal? Will it be a nuclear weapons convention? Or will it be after a disaster, whether a terrorist disaster or an accident, so a terrorist disaster with a dirty bomb, or an actual war with countries like India and Pakistan or North Korea, Iran, Israel today? I don't know. And, and that leaves me concerned. Uh, so while I do see, uh, see the chance uh, of, uh, of hope, and I do see elements of that, I don't know. But I'll end with this uh, thing from Margaret Mead, which many of you have seen, and I think sociologists may know uh, more. 
that, uh, that people can change the world. And we've seen that with landmines, with smoking, with many other things. So I, I, I do think that it's certainly possible, but it's going to involve a lot of work. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.